Hi everyone, this is a recording of the Chirilla Historical Linguistics Labs presentation at the recent Linguistic Society of America's annual meeting. We're going to be talking about accessibility, discoverability and functionality, an audit of and recommendations for digital language archives. Thanks, Claire. Okay, so um, we're gonna start with some backgrounds about language archives. Um, so here's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, for our study, we did a review of digital language archives, um, particularly for endangered and under-resourced languages. Um, so as we all know, um, a large portion of the world's languages are in some state of loss, which makes um, language documentation and uh, the accessibility of the materials that are being documented and preserved um, very crucial for future use and reclamation purposes. Um, so yeah, digital language documentation is now the standard, but um, they are very heterogeneous uh, across archives and um, archives vary in standards and quality. Uh, so what is an archive? For our purposes, we define an archive to be a repository of language data um, with the aim of preserving and disseminating those materials. So from Austin 2021, um, an archive should appraise materials, preserve them long-term, make their existence discoverable, um, and facilitate their appropriate distribution. Um, and so, yeah, digital language archives uh, have many pros and cons. Um, and if you've ever used a digital language archive, you're probably familiar with these. Um, so a pro would be that they can be more compact than analog materials. They allow for the digital manipulation of data. Um, it allows for wider accessibility of data um, through using the internet. And uh, theoretically, you can copy digital materials uh, an infinite number of times without altering the original. Um, however, some cons are that electronic storage me uh, mediums have poor longevity at times, um, and they can still be vulnerable to environment environmental conditions and also more like digital uh, things like data corruption, server issues, and internet outages. Um, additionally, the long-term readability uh, is, is varying. And as technology changes, um, we need to make sure that digital language archives um, can, can still be used even if technology is changing. Um, so the problem we're looking at is uh, digital language corpora are very heterogeneous. Um, a lot of the standards of, uh, surrounding digital language archives were standardized, or, sorry, formalized um, uh, a long time ago, and it was before much of the recent digital work was possible. Um, additionally, a much of the much of linguistic training focusing focuses on producing material for archives, such as like um, gathering language materials through field work or something, um, rather than working on materials from archives uh, where you're using archives as a starting point for um, some type of linguistic work. Um, additionally, some collections have fallen out of maintenance. Um, you know, uh, websites are not actively maintained at times. Um, so yeah, now we're going to move on to the review. So to review the audit that we performed, we surveyed roughly 50 archives from the perspective of an end user rather than this perspective of a depositor who would deposit those materials in the archive. We focused primarily on three criteria, namely accessibility and findability which includes what languages a user needs to know to access an archive and to navigate its collections. Discoverability, which refers to the availability of the material within the collections and how users can navigate those archives. And find, finally, functionality, which refers to how usable the materials are within those archives and the, what functions at the site and archive do or do not promote that usability. There are a few caveats to our survey, primarily Archives do not receive the funding they need, and a lot of this work is unpaid and very much a thankless job. We do not wish to discredit the value of this work. It's very important and it does need to be done. Um, at the same time, we do believe that a collection that is incomplete or imperfect is better than having no archive at all. So we do not wish to discourage archiving at all from the standards we set up in this recommendation. Um, finally, we need to clarify that our opinions and the, our positionality is from the endpoint of academics, not necessarily the communities and language groups that might be using these materials for purposes of cultural reclamation or language education. So that needs to be acknowledged. At the same time, we do believe that our perspective offers some valuable insights into the nature of language archives and 
points where they could improve. You're not naming archives directly, keep, um, keeping this in mind. We're not trying to name and shame individual archives. These perspectives are, and these issues are happening across the board and pretty much everyone can be doing better. So with this in mind, we're focusing on issues that happen on a large scale. Uh, furthermore, we really want to raise these points that future archivists can raise the standards of what their work is going to be. And this in turn will help make sure the field is uh, tenable for the future. So for our results, firstly, we'll be focusing on accessibility results. Accounts and registration is the first tier of accessibility of any archive or any website. Um, some archives are open access, some require a free account registration at most, and some require specific permission to access individual collections. Many archives combine these three modes of access. Uh, this is not an issue in that it, can it often is used to respect the wishes of individual language communities and researchers, but it can be clumsily executed in ways that unnecessarily impede the research of, of um, academics and language communities. For example, it, for some uh, archives, account registration is built into Google Forms, and meaning that lost and forgotten passwords can't be retrieved. So if you make an account and lose your password, you have to make an entirely new one to access the archive. Uh, furthermore, the time elapsed between account registration and actual access of the archive can be a matter of hours or sometimes days. Um, not all archives streamline the process to request permission to access individual collections. In one archive, they require that you mail in a physical copy of the request form, which is not a viable option for every researcher. Um, yeah, and some archives were only, or in some collections in those archives were only available through institutional access, meaning you needed an institutional email or a password. While this can provide access to academics, we have to wonder what language communities who are not affiliated with academic institutions are losing out in terms of access to these cultural materials. Secondly, interface language is a very important aspect of accessibility. Of the archives we, suffer, uh, we surveyed, only one third offered more than one language interface. And it was particularly striking that of the available languages, they tended to be in very well-resourced European languages, namely English, French, and Spanish. Uh, plugging sites into Google Translate was not fully an option either because languages, uh, languages translated through Google Translate do not necessarily fully translate the entire site. Sometimes translations were inaccurate, especially when languages were very different to European languages structurally. And these translations often removed functionality, meaning that some links became unclickable once they were plugged through the filter. Um, furthermore, this emphasizes that the majority of languages and digital materials available to Indigenous users are in English, even though English isn't the primary language for many. And this further exacerbates existing divides in Indigenous communities where access to English language knowledge remains a critical issue. We point to Paradisec as a great example of an archive that makes its content available not only in multiple languages, but in languages that are very relevant to a specific region. For example, talk piece in, given that it focuses on Australian and Oceanic languages. Um, but other languages just do not have viable translations through language translation filters. For example, in this translation, the name James Woodward is transliterated literally, which makes it lose its connection to the tag in the archive. So not only are we getting poor translations, but we're losing functionality of the archive. Uh, this issue is repeated again, where um, we see that buttons and, and links no longer become click are no longer clickable once they're translated in this Kyrgyz translation example. Uh, in some other instances, only parts of the website were translated. So we see the elicitation is translated into Kyrgyz once and then not, not in the other. Disability accommodations are another critical aspect of accessibility for archives and indeed any other website. It is essential that archives are designed in a way that is accessible to users who rely on assistive technology to navigate the internet. Because we are not experts or we, and we are not experienced in using screen readers to navigate the internet, we felt that we were not able to properly survey archives for their compatibility with screen readers as this wouldn't have been an honest reflection of our understanding of it. Um, but nevertheless, we strongly re recommend that principles of accessible web design, which have long since been standardized, should be followed. Most archives were friendly to users with color deficiencies, but a few did suffer from low contrast between the font and background color, which can be an issue for users who are colorblind or who have other visual impairments. 
these issues are pretty easily rectified in terms of the overall scope of web design issues. So we strongly recommend that they be followed. Overall, our recommendations for accessibility include broadly streamline the process for account registration and permission requests, but do not remove these impediments necessarily. Uh, to implement a wider array of display languages when possible, especially those that are relevant to the language communities hosted in these archives. Finally, to follow principles of accessible web design. These are baseline standards that will greatly improve accessibility of archives across the board. Our next category is discoverability. Um, one issue we saw with discoverability was in search functions and mislabeling. Uh, users often can't see information about a collection before accessing it and opening it, which makes browsing more cumbersome. Um, collections also frequently do not outwardly indicate their size or the types of files they store. Um, Again, you have to click into the into the collection to find out more about it. Um, also, the ability to perform searches within collections was absent from most archives, just searching for collections. Um, searches were often uh, hampered by missing metadata, uh, incorrect tags, and case sensitivity uh, that allowed some collections to um, disappear in certain searches, even if they were relevant. Um, also, despite its importance for researchers, only five archives allowed users to filter searches by media and file type, um, which uh, would hamper those who are looking for specific types of files. Um, and sometimes EAF files were mislabeled in browsers XML files. So this is an example. Uh, of um, an archive that did a good job of allowing for um, that sort of filtering in search. This is the Alaska Native Language Archive. And um, in the picture, or the picture shows um, that it allows the user to filter their search by whether a collection contains text files, audio files, or both. Um, we also saw some problems in metadata, uh, how they were recorded. Um, there is little consistency between archives uh, and how much or what kind of metadata is offered, um, as well as how it's displayed. Um, even within archives, collections varied wildly in the sort of metadata they provided, uh, and that makes navigation difficult because meta the metadata also um, affects the, the searching for uh, collections, so it can also allow certain collections to disappear in a targeted search. Um, metadata is also sometimes layered, uh, so there would be one set of metadata for a whole collection, uh, then a different set of metadata for individual folders within the collection, and then sometimes even a whole different set of metadata just for individual files. Um, we also saw some issues with site maintenance. Um, some sites required Yale VPN access for us, uh, researching through Yale. Um, some sites still require a flash player, which was uh, discontinued as of December 2020 and blocked as of January 2021. So accessing these sites is now impossible. Um, also, server loss and movement can cause data loss. Uh, especially if a website is not maintained properly. Um, and the Wayback Machine does not capture uh, sufficient snapshots to fully restore lost archives and does not um, maintain links. Uh, many archives also suffered from pervasive broken links, um, which makes navigation extremely difficult. Uh, okay, so we offer these recommendations. Um, we recommend that archives offer more clear and detailed descriptions of collection content, uh, especially available before clicking into the collection. Um, we recommend that archives allow users to search by file type and they ensure the correct labeling of file type.
um, our next category is functionality. Um, in this category, we mainly saw issues in site content, structure, and downloads. Um, most critically, uh, most archives that we looked at, 34 out of the 41, uh, offered no option to bulk download collections, only um, one file at a time. This makes it extremely difficult and time consuming to download large collections, um, like some that have over 15,000 files. Um, and even smaller collections could be difficult to download in their entirety. Um, also, file downloads cause a loss of ne nested file structure, um, which again leads to more time spent trying to maintain format. Um, for large collections, uh, especially those that with imprecise file names, this makes it especially hard to um, find matched content, such as um, an audio track that has a separate uh, transcription file and separate translation file. Uh, okay, so for this category, um, we recommend that archives offer bulk download options and also specifically offer uh, the option of shopping cart of downloads um, so that users can download specific files that they need all at once versus just downloading an entire collection. Okay, so moving on to our conclusions. Um, again, to reiterate, uh, we as academics, we do not represent uh, the entirety of all archive users. Um, and they, these results do not encompass the full breadth of what needs to be addressed, um, especially for community members using language archives as starting points for language reclamation and pedagogy. Um, and we also reiterate that, uh, again, archives often depend on volunteer labor um, and archives are often very underfunded. Um, and it usually takes a lot more uh, funds and labor to have this type of long-term maintenance, but we can still take steps to ensure that these language materials um, that often rely on archives um, to be preserved, uh, we can work, take these steps to make sure that they are well kept and safe and accessible for future use. Um, and so yeah, just to go over our overall recommendations again, um, in terms of accessibility, uh, looking at accessible web design, streamlining um, the streamlining the process for accessing permission and registration, um, and expanding interface languages of the archive sites, um, and then in terms of uh, um, discoverability, having the ability to search by file type, having more. Um, clearer and more uh, consistent metadata, and also making sure that uh, file types are correct correctly labeled. Um, and then in terms of functionality, having the option to bulk download or having that shopping cart download option uh, will help uh, streamline the process of using uh, archive materials. So going forward, um, we want to look at, uh, I guess, in terms of uh, like in linguistic circles, there's some like uh, the idea of corpus linguistics and that uses different corpora like COHA or COCA. Um, and we used um, corpora that were more uh, describing under-resourced and um, endangered languages. So um, a comparison between the uh, corpora and materials between these types of corpora would be uh, important. Um, and also, we would like to look into um, what documentation archives have uh, talking about their long term backup plans. So um, uh, do they do they have some sort of system in case their website uh, uh, is taken down or in case uh, links are broken and stuff um, because uh, because this material is so important and because it's stored in these archives, we need to make sure that um, the materials are also uh, backed up in a long-term and secure um, way. And then we'd also like to look at mobile access of um, archives uh, because a lot of communities, uh, in a lot of communities, phones are the primary means of accessing the internet. And so if these archives are available on the internet, we need to make sure that um, tablet and phone access for these archives uh, are also very usable. Um, 
And we would also lastly like to look at um, more experiences from end users, especially community members, uh, again, who use language archives for language reclamation and pedagogy. Um, so yeah, thank you. These are our references.